Hello, my name is Colin, and in this Blender 2.8 tutorial, we'll be talking about Blender 2.8's integrated rigid body physics engine. Blender has a physics engine built in. That means, without much effort on your part, you can simulate objects in real space with gravity so that objects can fall, objects can therefore bump into one another, push each other over, knock each other over. Objects can act in a realistic fashion like they would if they were solid objects without you having to do much work at all except set the scene up without having to do any animation at all. You can get a great looking scene. In fact, in this video, in the last part of this video, we're going to create this simple scene of a wrecking ball on a chain and it's going to knock over a whole stack of Jenga-like uh, blocks all stacked up and it'll actually be quite easy to set up and once you create it you can have it as a blender scene 3d file and you could render it out to a movie file if you like speaking of which if you've not checked out the latest videos in this blender 2.8 tutorial series on my channel in this series i'm teaching you from the ground up from the beginner level how to use blender in order to create 3d models 3d animations short animated movie productions on your own of course if you like this video or if you're done something, please go ahead and click on that like button below this video. It really helps out me and my channel. And if you want to see more videos like this one in Blender 2.8 or in the Godot game engine, click on that subscribe button as well and click on the bell icon to be notified whenever I upload a new tutorial. So physics simulation in Blender 2.8 starts with a scene just like normal. You get a cube mesh object, a camera, and a light. We're going to simulate uh, not this cube object. Uh, I'll select it and press X to delete it on my keyboard and I'll click on delete. I'm going to go up to add and I'm going to add a new mesh object. Let's use a monkey head because monkey heads are cool and they're better looking and they have uh, more geometry, more faces and edges to work with, which will make the simulation of the object bumping into other things more interesting. In order to set up a rigid body simulation or a rigid body world, you have to enable uh, physics on an object by object level. So if I select this object and I press play on my timeline, well, nothing happens. It's just a mesh, just like normal. But if I pause and go back to the beginning, this is important. You'll get into the habit of using this back to frame one button uh, a lot in this video. If I select a mesh object, I can go up to the object menu and then I'll select under rigid body. I'm going to make this object be added to my physics simulation as an active object. An active object will fall with gravity and it can bump into other objects, any kind of an object. In fact, it can get pushed around. It can stop when I hit something that's heavier or a passive object. We'll talk about that in a minute. But an active object is basically a real world object. If I select that, well, this object is now part of my rigid body physics simulation. And if I go back to frame one and I press play, it will fall. In fact, it'll keep falling. If I scroll down, there it is. And you'll notice that there are no keyframes on my timeline, like recording or uh, showing me how that movement works. But there is this orange bar. This orange bar is there whenever you have an object that's a rigid body object uh, selected in your scene, the monkey head is selected. This is called the cache, the memory. Cache means memory of your simulation. This cache is part of your Blender file and it represents where or it stores where that object is and its rotation and scale and everything uh, on a frame. In fact, even more than frame by frame uh, in that scene from frame one to 250, which is your default timeline length. If I pause, I can then drag the top of my playhead around and uh, I can look at any frame in my uh, simulation. The thing that kind of trips new Blender users or new users to Blender 2.8 especially up is that if you are somewhere looking at your object and you're on some random frame, if you try moving your object, I'm just going to keep my selection tool, but I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut G. G is grab. If I tap G and then move the object and then click, well, normally it would stay where I click. But if you're in the middle of your cache, that cache will go, hey, no, I'm not going to let you move that object because I know that it's supposed to be where I have simulated it to be, which is, well, it's in the middle of falling. The problem is, is that it actually did move that object. And in Blender 2.8, this is something that I hope they fix or solve or let you know what's going on. Because if you then go back to frame one, look what happens. It kind of erased the simulation and it actually put it 
there. So you won't actually see your movement until you go back to frame one or frame zero, which means that you should go back to frame one or frame zero before you make any changes of any objects in your simulation, okay? Get into the habit of that. That will lessen the frustration of editing or moving things in your simulation, and it'll get you in the habit of knowing that you have to re-simulate once you change anything, okay? So if I don't want it there, I can press Alt-G. Alt-G will do the same as clear the location. Alt-G does that. It'll put it back where it was, and then I'm, because I'm on frame one or frame zero, I can then move or use the G key to move that object up, and uh, I can then press play to re-simulate. Okay, but I don't want the monkey head to fall. I want to and keep going. I want to hit a ground. So I'm going to add a mesh plane and a plane object is just a mesh that has one surface, but four sides. It's basically two triangular sub polygons, essentially, in my words. Uh, if I tap S, I can make this bigger by moving my mouse, of course, and I can click. And if I press play from frame one, it should simulate, but that ground is not yet part of my rigid body world. Every object needs to be added. So I'm going to go back to the beginning again, get in the habit of using that button, and I'm going to select my ground, go up to object, and I'm going to go to rigid body and say add passive this time. Passive objects are physics objects. They are part of your simulation, but passive objects do not fall and they cannot be pushed or influenced by other objects. They're kind of rock solid objects like the earth. They can't move, they're glued down. So this is now a passive rigid body object. I'll go back to frame one, make sure I'm there, press play, and now the monkey head will fall. It'll hit that object and it'll react and basically land on the ground. And as you can see, it looked pretty good. If I kind of scrub through where I have that cache on the uh, on the monkey head or in my whole scene, you can see it lands, it tips over just like it normally would, and it comes to a stop eventually. It's kind of doing a little bit of rocking back and forth. Great. Are we done? Is that it? Well, no. There's actually a lot of things you need to know, uh, well, at least a, a fair amount of things you need to know in order to keep going with physics beyond this basic knowledge. This way, going to the object menu and selecting objects and changing them into uh, active objects and passive objects from rigid body isn't the best way of going about things. Generally, you want to have more control, and that more control is over here in your properties editor. This editor has lots of tabs at the side, of course. One of the tabs that we haven't explored yet in this two-point tutorial series is the physics tab. It looks like a little, uh, I'm actually not sure what it's supposed to be. If it's supposed to be like an earth with a moon going around it, or an atom with a nucleus and an electron going around it, or the sun and the earth, I don't know. It's one of those things, maybe something else, but that's what it looks like to me. Uh, if you select it and you select a mesh, there will be a bunch of options for you here. I'll make this a little bit bigger. Uh, and if you haven't yet added it as an active or passive object, you'll see basically this, nothing except for these buttons. This is where you can enable different types of physics. Rigid body is just one of the types. If you click rigid body, that's the same as going up to object rigid body, okay? Um, and doing it as we did before. Again, I should go back to frame one before I do anything like this, okay? Uh, you can change the type here once you select rigid body from active to passive or whichever you like. You can also change the mass, so you can make something act like a heavier object. Keep in mind that this scene right now is gigantic. Every one of these squares in my grid floor is one meter by one meter by default. That's really huge. This is a gigantic, very light as a balloon <laughs> monkey head. So if I turn this up to, let's say, you know, uh, let's say 10 kilograms and press enter, and if I re-simulate, it will act a little bit different. It'll feel a little bit more heavy, or at least act like that uh, in my scene, okay? There are a lot more settings though. Right now, uh, this monkey head is not actually bumping into other things using the shape of its own mesh. It's using what's called a convex hull. A convex hull is basically a low poly shrink wrap around your mesh. So it's not using every single vertice and edge. It's a low poly version that you can't see, and that just helps speed things up. You'll notice that when you simulate, if I go back to the beginning and press play, if you were to simulate, let's actually just move something a little bit so that it has to re-simulate, that you'll be playing back at a certain frames per second, and it should be playing back at 24 by default. If it's going slower than that for you, it's because you've got a lot of things in your scene and it's having to calculate things out. But the fact that this monkey head is a convex hull is helping it out because the convex hull is lower polygon. 
If you want to use or simulate your objects in a simpler way, you could, let's say, change the collision shape to a box, and therefore it'll just use a six-sided collision bounds. And if you simulate from the beginning on frame one with a box shape, it'll act just like a box and it'll land just like that. In fact, you could do this a lot. You could have a lot more monkey heads and it wouldn't slow down as much. I'll duplicate this one, Shift D, and I'll tap Z on my keyboard to move it up and down on the Z axis, and I'll move it up and click. Maybe I'll move it over a little bit. And uh, if I simulate, they will land on each other flat. So they will act like they are just boxes. You don't actually see the boxes when you render out a frame or a, an animation, but that's how they interact with one another, okay? If you uh, uh, go back to the beginning on frame one, and you change them both, uh, their collision shape, to let's say a sphere, then they will act like spheres. They will roll around. Be careful though, at least two spheres are intersecting, they're overlapping, so I might want to move them apart. And let's say I take my ground and I rotate it. Uh, pardon my, uh, maybe I'll change the uh, size, the text size of, uh, you know, change it to 24 or something to make that smaller so it's not quite so uh, in the way. Good. Okay. If I rotate the ground, uh, that's just my screencast keys add-on, so you can see what keys I'm pressing. Uh, if I rotate the ground and now simulate and there's spheres, well, they will uh, roll down. Okay. Hey, not too bad. Pretty easy, pretty effective, looks realistic. Uh, I'm going to undo that rotation on frame one, and I'm going to get rid of this uh, second monkey head. If I want the objects to interact when they touch a little bit differently, in other words, maybe I want the monkey head ball, the sphere, to bounce. Well, there are more settings under the physics tab for each object. One of the categories is called surface response. If I open that up, you get two settings, friction and bounciness. We'll leave friction for uh, a minute or two from now, but if I play with bounciness, it goes from zero to one. If I turn it up to, let's say, oh, 0 0.9, and I press enter. Well, if I go back to frame one and I simulate, it doesn't quite act as you'd expect, and it's not exactly like a bouncy ball yet. That's because both objects that are colliding need to have at least some bounciness. And that's a little bit weird, I know, but I'll turn the floor's bounciness up to 0 0.9 as well, and I'll go back to the beginning, and I'll simulate, and now it, uh, it bounces the way you might expect. Sometimes it still acts a little bit weird, though, I find. It might just keep bouncing, especially if you turn them all the way up to 1 for both objects. Uh, I wouldn't do that. That's why I chose 0 0.9, okay? Again, sometimes things just act a little bit weird and not as you'd expect in the simulation engine. I'm going to turn bounciness down on both objects to illustrate this, and I'm going to add another object. I'm going to add a cube, and I'm going to make the cube a bit bigger. And uh, I'm going to tap S and then Z to squash it down into like a flat kind of platform. And I'm going to move it up a little bit. If you double tap R, the R rotate key, if you tap it twice, you can then rotate it around kind of free form. I'm just doing this so I can rotate it a little bit off kilter. And I'm going to add it to the rigid body scene. I'm going to make it an active object, but I'm going to make it be a box or have a box collision shape, okay? So it'll simulate more easily. This box is pretty big, but it's only one kilogram, and it's gonna land on the floor now because it's an active object. The monkey head is 10 kilograms. I'm gonna turn that up to about 40 kilograms, which is quite heavy, and I'm gonna simulate from frame one or frame zero, and let's see what happens. Aha, good. It did what I want, which is actually not very good. It, it pushed because the monkey head ball is heavy. It actually pushed that light box right through the floor. Now, there's a few ways you could deal with this. And by the way, the floor just kept falling once it, uh, it went through the floor. Now, there's a few ways you can deal with this. The first way is you can make your ground into a box. In other words, you can make your ground thicker, and therefore maybe if the box that was on top went into it, it would get pushed back out of it upwards and not downwards, okay, because it actually would have volume or perceived volume in that solid object. The other way we can fix this is under a different tab in the properties window. 
we can go to the scene tab and the scene tab has a section called rigid body world the scene tab looks like a cone object and a sphere object and i think that's supposed to be a little light it's the settings for your whole scene it has a rigid body world section and if you don't want any simulation or you want to turn it off you can check this checkbox uh, that will disable any physics simulation in your scene but this is where settings for your whole world is in terms of physics simulation one of the settings is called steps per second and it's set to 60 by default this setting is how often or how rapidly Blender calculates where the object should be in a rigid body scene. So it doesn't use the 24 frames per second to figure out where the object should move to in, in the next frame. It uses kind of in between a smaller increment, which is good. It'll be more accurate. The higher number this is, uh, at least theoretically, if I want my scene to be more accurate, I can turn this up higher. I like doubling it or tripling it to 120 or 180. Uh, let's try 120 and I'll go back to frame one. If I now play the same example, exact scene with the same locations at the beginning uh, let's see aha it works uh, it works a lot better do I have bounciness turned up under my physics tab on anything still no it just was a little bit bouncy sometimes things don't act quite like they should maybe you could try turning under that scene tab again the steps per second maybe 180 might work better maybe 300 or 500 would work better for you it all depends on blender's mood at the time really or what's in your scene or how it's moving or the locations or their settings it's all variable you can try what you like sometimes things actually work better with 60 but a higher number okay so that's steps per second while we're here, let's talk about the cache settings. Right now, this cache is orange, it's filled up, I've simulated the scene, but even if my timeline, if I change it to be a longer timeline, like 500, 500 frames, and I press enter, so I could actually keep playing past 250, it would not let me simulate a longer simulation, even if I wanted my animation to be longer. If I press play, well, it'll, you know, the ball will, will kind of keep rolling, and uh, then it'll just stop and it won't even let me simulate more. That's because of my cache settings. The cache is only set to go from one to 250. If I expand this section out, again, this is under my scene tab, you can see my cache start and end values. I actually cannot, I can change it so I'm not simulating right from the beginning if I don't want to. If I want my simulation to start after a little while, I can change that, but I can also make it go longer. So if I want 500, I can type that in or drag in this little value box uh, and make it whatever I want okay now if I go back and press play it will keep simulating and the ball will fall off and because the, the, the ball is heavy it'll push it at the, the light box and it'll keep going it'll probably fall off if I let it go far enough okay so that's your cache simulation start and end if you want a longer simulation than the default 250 okay let's go ahead and make a little bit of a fun scene now and let's talk about animated objects interacting with simulated objects i'm going to delete both of these objects i'll select them both and press delete and uh, i will add i'll press shift a to bring up my add menu i'm going to add a mesh cube this is going to be a domino we're going to make a lineup of dominoes that are going to fall over and we're going to make an animated object like a little finger object that pushes all the uh, dominoes over so this domino needs to be a bit uh, different shaped i'm going to move it up i'm going to tap in fact i'll use my scale tool i'm going to make it a little bit thinner on the red x-axis and i'll make it a bit taller on the uh, blue z-axis so roughly this shape and I want to be a physics object it's just a default mesh right now so I'll go to the uh, physics little earth moon tab and I'll make it a rigid body I need to go back to frame one otherwise it'll act kind of weird and it's going to be lighter than this maybe 0 0.5 kilograms remember this is really big so we're not really doing very well on our uh, simulation front here and uh, or at least our accuracy in terms of scale front here this needs to be an active object it is it needs to be simpler so we can simulate tons of dominoes if we want so i'm not going to use a convex hull i'm going to use a box shape okay that'll simulate very easily because a box only has six sides and 12 edges and eight vertices it's, it's very easy for it to simulate and i'm going to duplicate it so i'm going to i'll keep my move tool up actually i'm going to move it over Straight about there maybe i'll start it a little bit above the ground so it has to fall a little bit uh, if i play it right now it'll kind of land and wiggle a little bit and from frame zero if i duplicate shift d and i tap uh, x shift d is duplicate and then if you tap x it'll only let you move the, the copy uh, on the x axis so 
be like that. In fact, I'm going to go and press the little green dot right there to go to my front view exactly so it's straight on so I can see what I'm doing. Okay, so I'm going to select both and I'll duplicate both now to make it faster. Shift D and then X and move it over, maybe over a little bit more. And I'll grab all four with the shift key and shift D and X. And uh, I like that. I like having eight and I'll make the ground a little bit bigger with the S key. Okay, if I go back to frame one or zero and I press play, it'll simulate. Uh, in order to make them fall over though, I could just from frame one, go to my front view, and uh, that's the one key on your number pad, by the way, or you can press the little green dot, not the one with the Y on it, to go to your front view. If I tap R, I can rotate this one, and therefore it'll fall over if I rotate it enough. And if I simulate, of course, it'll knock all the other ones over and I've got a pretty cool little scene. You'll notice though that things were sliding around a whole lot and this is where friction comes in and I want to show you how to copy a setting that you change for an object from one object like friction and I want you to be able to update all your objects at once to have that new updated friction setting. So I'm going to go back to frame zero and I'm going to select all of my dominoes here. Now you'll notice that as I select more and more with the shift key held down the the last one that I select is this lighter orange color and all the previous selected ones are still selected but they're darker orange. That's because the last, the most recent one you select is your active object and that's what you see the settings of over here. So this one is now the active object, they're all selected. If I change the friction, uh, I'm actually going to be only changing the friction of the active one, the most recently selected one. So I'll type in, maybe I'll just drag this to some random number like 0.685. If I were to select just this one, it would show me 0.5 because I haven't changed this one or any of the other ones, just this one. In order to copy the settings from the active physics object over to the other ones, you can go up to the object menu and go down to rigid body and say and select uh, copy from active and that will let you change your settings really quickly from one object and copy them over to the other one. So or all the other ones that are selected as well. So object, rigid body, copy from active click. And so now this one is a 0.85 friction. This one is also now, they're all now 0.685. Okay. I'm going to change the friction of my floor. I'll turn it up as well. And from frame one, I'll press play. And now the dominoes aren't sliding around so much. So they, they catch each other more and fall over a little bit nicer. Okay. Let's go ahead and add an animated object that influences our scene and show you how to do that. So I'm going to go back to frame one or frame zero. I'm going to get rid of, or actually I will alt R, alt R or object clear rotation. We'll clear the rotation of that object because I want it to stand straight up. I'm going to add a sphere and we're going to make it into like a finger shape really quickly and make it animated and make it push over the domino. So uh, shift A on my keyboard will bring up the add menu. I'll add a UV sphere. There it is. I'll make it a little bit smaller by tapping S. I'll grab it and put it over here. I'm going to scale it. I'll use my scale tool and drag it to make it skinnier and longer on the X axis. And I want to animate it. If you're not familiar with adding keyframes and animating, or you want to learn a little bit more in that, perhaps check out my video. Uh, that's from a few months ago on animation in Blender 2.8. In that video, I show you lots of things like getting into curves and the dope sheet editor and how to animate properties like colors. Uh, so an object can change colors over time or have their properties changed over time. Lots of great stuff in that video. Okay. So if you are familiar with animation, you know that this auto keying button is the easiest way to insert keyframes. I'm going to go with the auto keying button turned on to frame, uh, and this is still simulating, but I know that this domino is right on this line in my grid. So I'm going to go to frame uh, 30. I'm going to ignore how that's, that's looking there. And on frame 30, I'm going to move my, uh, in fact, I'll just use the G key. I'm going to put my finger right here, not quite yet pushing the uh, the first domino. And I've got auto keying turned on, so that means the finger has a keyframe and we've told it to be there at that time. I'm going to go to frame 40 and move it. I'll tap G so that it's going to hit where that line is, the domino. And it has a keyframe there because auto keying is turned on. I'm going to go to frame 50 and move it back. 
So I'll use G and just move it back. So I've got three keyframes. It's going to be before not hitting the first domino. It's going to be then moving forward and intersecting where that domino is. And then it's going to come back. And by that time, hopefully, this one at least has been pushed over. Let's go ahead and go back to frame zero. The simulation's kind of messed up now. If I select it, yeah, it's kind of not working. But if we start from zero and press play, let's go and see what happens. And you know what? I need to go back to the beginning. And uh, do I just want to delete that one? Yeah. And I'll just duplicate this one. Shift D and then X. And uh, yeah, I'll just put it there. Okay. Uh, I had auto keying turned on by accident, so I'll turn that uh, off and I'll delete my keyframe. Make sure you don't put any keyframes on uh, objects that are going to be simulated. Okay, that will mess them up. So I have no keyframes on any dominoes. I've got keyframes on the finger. Let's go ahead and press play and it simulates, but the finger went through the domino. It didn't push it over. We need to make this finger object a rigid body physics object. So I'm going to go back to frame one. I'm going to, with my finger selected, I'm going to make it a rigid body object. The key here is to enable animation, make it an animated rigid body object. If I don't, if I leave it as an active object, it'll just ignore its keyframes and it'll just fall. And the keyframes will mean nothing. If I go back to the beginning and enable animation, it will now no longer really act like an active object. It'll still have its shape. It'll be a convex hull, at least by default, but it will not fall. It will not be able to be pushed around. So really, it'll act like an animated passive object. And for that reason, I mean, this will work if I press play and then I let it simulate, it'll push the dominoes over quite nicely. But if I change this to passive, It'll do the same thing, but I think passive makes more sense to me. Unless you want to actually animate this value and turn animated off and on, I think it makes more sense to make your animated objects passive objects that are animated rather than active objects that are animated. Not that it makes a huge difference, but it makes more sense to me. So from frame zero, I'm going to press play. I'm going to simulate. It's going to knock over the uh, dominoes, and that's how you make animated objects part of your physics scene and use their animations. That's great. Uh, I will note that if you have your scene settings in for my scene, for this scene, for some reason, if you use a steps per second that's different, you might get it acting kind of weird. I think I prefer for this scene 60, the default steps per second. So that's under the scene tab again, under rigid body world settings. If I press play, if I go back to the beginning and press play now, it'll re-simulate. And I don't know if that looked any better, but sometimes it does. Okay, just keep that in mind. Okay, let's go ahead now and make our last kind of mini project of this video, which is that chain wrecking ball scene, knocking over all the Jenga blocks. Let's go ahead and delete some of these objects. We don't need any of our physics objects except for the ground. And so I'll select all those and delete those. And let's go ahead and add a new cube to be a Jenga block. Uh, I'll go up to add mesh cube. And uh, a Jenga block is three times as long as it is wide. And that's because they'll need to be three wide and uh, three deep is essentially in the stack of three by three. And each alternating stack row layer is uh, turned by 90 degrees. In order to make all these Jenga bricks, we're not going to duplicate manually and place them all manually. We're going to use a modifier called the array modifier. Before we get there though, let's uh, actually scale this down. So I'm going to tap with the cube selected uh, S and then Z, and I'm gonna scale it up and down. I don't really care how tall it is, that can be up to you. I am gonna scale it on the Y axis now. So I'll tap S and then Y to scale it only like in that direction. This time I know I'm gonna to wanna to type after S and then Y 3.03 and press enter. That's because I know I want to be exactly three times or a little bit more than three times longer here than uh, here because they're going to be twisted and in layers and stacked in that way. So a good practice here is to apply scaling before you enable physics on an object. I'm not sure that you need to in Blender 2.8, but if you scale an object, I would go up to object, apply, 
and scale. And that means, and that'll tell Blender that that's really the actual size of the object. Again, I think in Blender 2.8 they've solved this. Uh, it might just be an unneeded precaution, but it's not a bad idea. So this is just a mesh right now. I'm going to go to the physics tab and enable it as a rigid body. Uh, I need to go back to frame one so it's not playing with me in weird physics-y ways. And I'm going to turn the mass down to 0 0.5 so it's lighter. Uh, I might as well move it a little bit closer to the ground. It's a little bit above the ground, a little bit over, and I want there to be three in a row. And I'm not going to duplicate these manually. In fact, before I change anything, uh, I'm going to point out that I have a convex hull here. It would make more sense for me to have this as a box. And after I make all my Jenga bricks, I could fix them uh, the way I changed all my settings at once of my dominoes, but I'm just going to fix it right now. So box. Okay, that's better than convex hull. If I want to make more Jenga bricks, I'm going to go to the wrench tab, which is how you add modifiers. Modifiers, if you're not familiar, because I haven't covered these in my previous videos in this tutorial series, uh, modifiers are ways of procedurally changing a mesh or adding to your scene uh, in a way that, again, is procedural. That means like mathematical or using an algorithm, not editing it manually. These modifiers under the wrench tab, you can add a modifier to different objects. One of them is called the array modifier under the generate column. So under the wrench tab, add modifier, array. An array, if you're a programmer, you know what an array is. An array is a bunch of copies of the same kind of an object, usually ordered or in a row. Uh, there are multi-dimensional arrays of basically arrays of arrays. In this case, with physical objects, you have offset numbers, which is how many uh, or how spaced out the objects are in a physical space. You have a count number, how many objects copies of the original one that you want. So if you turn this number up, three, four, five, six, you get more and more copies. Don't worry about this extra bounding box. The offset is how spaced out they are. So you can see that's what it looks like. You can space them out. In fact, I'm going to space them out. This is a relative offset amount. And these three columns are for X, Y, and Z. So if you change these numbers, you can make like staircases and you can make them go in different directions. Uh, but I want zero and zero for Y and Z. Um, I want the relative offset number to be a little bit higher than one, like 1.0 uh, or 1 1.01. And that means that there's a little gap between each one, which is good. That means they're separate. And I only want three. Okay, so three including the original, which is three. Okay, so we've got uh, our three in a row. Now, the, the settings for the three are a little bit weird. The bounding box, the collision shape is going to be a little bit off. We'll fix that. But I'm going to press apply. Okay, and that means it's going to be one mesh, which is weird. If I press tab, they're all in the same mesh. Don't worry, we'll fix that later. Before we do, I'm going to make another array of these three so we can have them all in a stack. So I'm going to add a modifier. I'm going to make it an array. This time, I'm not going to offset it on the X axis. I'll click and type zero and press enter. I'm going to make them go up on the Z axis. And I don't want just one copy or two in total. I want to have probably 12. Okay, the reason why I want 12 and them spaced out is because we're going to have a duplicate stack and we're going to turn them by 90 degrees on the Z axis. So they're facing 90 degrees differently. So they're all alternating just like the game Jenga would be. So I'm going to make these spaced out by 2.03 and I'll press enter. And that way they'll be spaced out just enough that a whole duplicate stack can fit, each, a new row can fit in between each one with a little tiny gap in between. Uh, that's good. Don't worry about this bounding box that's wrong. We'll fix that. But I'm going to press apply. When you apply a modifier, it makes it permanent. And so now we have a permanent mesh that's going to act really weird. If I try to simulate this, yeah, it won't work very well. So uh, don't worry about that. We'll go back to frame zero and uh, we're going to duplicate this. So I'm going to go to my top view. If you press the 7 key on your numpad or you press the little Z circle up here, you can go to the top exact orthographic view. And I'm going to duplicate my Jenga block stack. So shift D on my keyboard. And I'm going to right click to put it right back where it was. And I'm going to tap R from the top view, R90, enter. Or R and then Z and 90, enter if you're looking at it from some other view. So now they're turned the opposite way but I want to make them lined up and I want to have it so that they uh, are alternating. 
So there we go, I tap G and I'm fixing that. So now if I zoom in, I can get that right. I don't want them to touch at all. And I didn't do quite a good job. They're a little bit longer length than the three side by side. That's okay for this video. Okay, so I need to adjust it from the front and the side. And there we go. I'm happy with that. Is there spacing all the way through? Uh, I think there is. I'm going to select both with shift and I'll join them all together in one big ugly mesh. So I'll tap uh, after I select them both uh, with shift. I'll press control J. Control J will join the two meshes together. Now I've got this big ugly mesh of a bunch of separate Jenga bricks all in the same mesh. It's really easy to separate them though, and that's what we're gonna do. Just press tab to go into edit mode. Uh, by the way, if you're not familiar with how to use edit mode in Blender 2.8, if you're not familiar with modeling tools and the concept of going into edit mode on a mesh, uh, editing the vertices, edges, and faces, I've got a video on this. It's my video on the introduction to edit mode and modeling in Blender 2.8. I'll put a link to that video on the screen right now. Uh, so go check that out if you wanna learn some modeling and you're not familiar with what I'm doing right now. Okay, so let's go ahead and make sure every Everything in edit mode, I mean edit mode, is selected. I'll press A on my keyboard to select all. And then I'm going to press the letter P. The letter P brings up the separate menu and I want to select loose parts. And so all the bricks are loose parts from one another. They're not actually attached. So if I click that, they will all now be their own mesh. But notice that I'm in edit mode still of one of them. So I'll press tab to go back into object mode. I've got them all selected, which is great. If I tried to simulate right now, it's gonna act really badly. <laughs> and that's because, and I might do different things for you, and that's because all of the origins are all, the little orange dot, which marks where the object kind of is, are all in the same spot. They're all in the origin of one of your Jenga bricks. So even though I select this Jenga brick, it thinks the origin of this one is down here. And the collision shape is based on where the origin is. So in other words, they, the simulation thinks that all the Jenga bricks are overlapping right here. And that's a bad thing. So I'm going to press one to go to my front view, or you can press the little green dot up there. And I'm gonna use my box selection tool and I'm gonna select all my Jenga bricks. And it doesn't matter which one is the active one because we're just gonna fix the origin and put the origins all to the middle of each Jenga brick really quick. To do that, I can right click with all the bricks selected and I can say set origin, I'm in object mode right now, by the way, set origin to geometry. And that'll put the origin to the median point or the average of the, the geometry of each separate object uh, all at once. So origin to geometry. And look, now all the dots are individually, the origins are where the actual bricks are. So now if I simulate from frame zero or one, aha, look, it's good. They bounce a little bit because, hey, they all have to fall a bit but uh, I like it. Okay, so if I go back to the beginning and let it play, there it is. How could I fix that bounciness? I'm really not that sure about that, actually. You might get less bounciness. Uh, we'll make sure that there is, under the physics tab, uh, no bounciness on the floor or anything, but that also might be fixed by changing the uh, rate of uh, sampling, which I showed you before under the scene tab. Uh, I've got steps per second set to 60. Let's try 120. And uh, But Jenga bricks would do that a little bit, especially if you have them all spaced out and you let them all go at once, there would be some bouncing that would happen. And that actually looks better, 120, okay? If I turn that up, it might actually happen less. I'm not sure. You can try that for yourself. So we've got a Jenga tower. Uh, I'll make my ground a bit bigger, by the way. I'll click and then I'll go back to the beginning just to make that permanent. Okay, let's go ahead and make our, our chain and our wrecking ball. That's pretty easy. I'm gonna go and add a torus, a default mesh torus. Uh, add mesh, I'm in object mode right now. Add mesh, a torus is like a donut. And it's gonna be what we're gonna use to make every link of our chain. Now when you add a torus, don't select anything else or change anything. Just follow along with me because we need to edit this torus. It's there's too many polygons here, and we're gonna actually use the mesh of this as a simulation because that'll work best. To edit the number of rings and details in this torus and to make it a bit thicker, I'm gonna go down to this Add Torus 
pop over and expand it. If you don't have an Add Torus one, it means that you have selected something else or you've tried moving it or something, don't do that. Open this up first. If you've already moved it, delete it, add a new one. Uh, let's go ahead and change the number of major and minor segments and the radii. Uh, so major segments are the ones that go around. There's too many of them. I'm gonna click and make 24. So it's a lower polygon donut and I'll leave the minor segments which are the ones that go around uh, at 12, that's fine. The major radius and the minor radius will dictate uh, how big, how thick it is and how big the hole is. And I kind of like uh, that. I'm gonna use these location numbers uh, to move it over a little bit. So on the X, maybe I'll move it a little bit negative and I'll move it up a little bit like that just so I can see it. And now I can go ahead and uh, move it around. I'm gonna go to my front view here and I'll tap G and move that up here. But I wanna make this look more like a link of a chain, which is a bit longer in the middle. So I'm gonna go into edit mode. I'll press tab and I'm gonna grab a couple of edge loops. I wanna grab the edges, so I'll go into edge select mode. This whole loop all the way around there and this one all the way around here. To select an edge loop, I hold Option or Alt on my keyboard. If you're on a Mac, it's the Option key. And if you hold Alt or Option and you click on an edge, it'll select all the edges that are next to each other or all in line with each other. So that means all the way around. So Alt, click, and then I'm gonna select this one as well. So opposite each other. Uh, so I'll hold Shift and Alt and I'll click on this one. So I've got two edge loops selected with the Alt key and the Shift Alt key, and now I'll bevel these two edge loops. When you bevel, Control B is bevel. You can move your mouse away from the middle of your selection and you can spread that one edge loop uh, on each side into two. So that's what I've done. Control B, I'll undo that and redo it. Control B and move my mouse and uh, left normal click to make it permanent. We're doing this because I want to take half of this torus and move it uh, away from the other one so that it's an elongated torus like a link of a chain. So to do that, I'm going to go into vertice select mode, go to my top view, and I'm gonna use my selection tools. Maybe I'll press Alt A to deselect, and I will use box select and box select half of the, uh, the donut link and then move those down, except watch out when you use box select from the top, it will only select the, the vertices you can see, and so that would not be a good thing. In order to select things on the back side of what you can't see in the background, you can enable X-ray mode up here. Okay, so if I turn X-ray on, I can see through the mesh. That means I can also select the back faces or the back vertices. So I'm gonna press Alt-A from the top view, use box select, click and drag, select everything on this side, make sure you can, you're can you selecting the top and bottom, and then I will use the move tool and move these away. So now I've got a link of a chain. I'm gonna press tab to go back into object mode. I'll turn off X-ray mode, and I think that I should fix the origin of this object to make it in the middle, but I'll actually make it rotate a little bit better when I simulate, believe it or not. So if I right click with that object selected, I can say set origin to geometry, and it'll move the, the origin to the middle. Okay, so I've got a link of my chain. I'm gonna go into my front view and I'm gonna move the first link in my wrecking ball chain right up there. And maybe I will rotate it so it's facing my front view. Uh, so I'll use my rotate tool and I'll rotate it on the X axis in my case. Maybe I'll hold control and I'll rotate it 90 degrees. I'm watching up here as I'm rotating, so I know that I'm rotating. When I hold control, it'll snap by five degree increments, like that. So now from the front view, it looks like that. From the side view, it's exactly straight up and down. I wanna duplicate this, so, so Shift D to make another link of my chain, and I'm gonna rotate it, but facing side to side. So I'm gonna grab the, the Z, rotate handle, hold control, and make sure I rotate it 90 degrees as well, okay? Or you could type R, Z, 90 and then press enter but uh, i want to show multiple ways of doing things so i've got these links fairly well lined up i don't care that it's not quite centered i could tap g and just kind of center that left and right a little bit but they are not physics objects yet i'm going to make this top one it's going to be locked to the ceiling my non-existent ceiling so i'm going to go to the physics tab my little earth moon tab and uh, select rigid body and this one's going to be passive i don't want it to fall down it's going to be bolted to the ceiling this one will be a rigid body object, it'll be active, so it'll fall. Let's go and see what happens if I press play from frame one. Aha, it did not work. 
I was hoping for that. That happens, they broke apart instantly because they think that they are intersecting and they pop away from each other. They think that they're intersecting because we're using convex hull. Convex hull is a simplified wrap around your uh, object. When you have a simplified mesh wrap around your object, it's kind of like shrink wrapping plastic over it. It does not allow holes. Okay, so if because we have a hole, this needs to be a mesh, which will be more taxing on your simulation on your computer, but that's what you need to have. Uh, that's why we made there be less uh, segments around our default torus a few minutes ago. So I've got mesh on both. Okay, I'm going to go back to the beginning and press play and it falls. That's great. Let's keep going. I'm going to duplicate that now that we've got it set up properly. Shift D. I'll move it down. I'll tap R, then Z, then 90 and enter. Okay, G. I'll move it down a little bit. So now I've got, if I simulate from the beginning, the beginnings of a chain. And hey, why don't I grab both of those and rotate them a little bit and put them back with the G key up there. And if I press play, hey, we've got a nice little beginning of a chain. I'm going to keep going. I'll go back, go back to frame one. I'll have both those selected. Duplicate, Shift D, grab, rotate, grab. Okay, so I think you get the point. If I simulate, I can keep going. If I don't think this is high enough, I might want to use my box selection tool. We'll grab it all, move it on frame one, and then I can make the chain as long as I want, as long as it doesn't hit the ground, okay? So I can keep going, Shift D, and I'll rotate and grab. Maybe I want to straighten some of these out, because I don't need it to be uh, quite as bendy in some parts. Okay, I'll grab all four, maybe even all eight of those. Shift D, and I'll rotate. And I kind of like that. Let's actually see how that simulates. Let's play. And that looks really, really good. It uh, it simulates, it all hits the ground. So I'm going to go back to the first frame. I like how long that chain is, but from the first frame, I'm going to move it all up. So I'll use my box select tool, G, grab, put it up there. And this last link needs to have a big ball attached to it. And I like just adding that in edit mode. Or actually, I might join it together. That might be better. If I press uh, Shift A to bring up the Add menu, I might add a mesh UV sphere. I'm going to tap S to make it bigger. It's way down there. I'm going to grab it, move it up. That's right about there. Uh, there it is. It's looking pretty good. And I'm going to join it. I'm going to select this one, hold Shift, select this one, Control J to join. It's one mesh now. Things rotate in the physics simulation engine in relation or the origin location will actually affect this. So I'm going to right click in object mode and say set origin to geometry. And that'll move this dot a bit more in the median of all these different points. Yes, this is a pretty bad mesh because you have two intersecting points. In x-ray mode, you can see the inside still exists like that. That's not ideal. Ideally, you would use different techniques to get these two things attached, but without having an inside part, most notably the Boolean modifier, if you're familiar. But uh, I have not gone over that yet on this channel, so I will leave it at this simple join method, okay? This link of the chain should not be one kilogram like all the other links. It should be heavier. So I'm going to turn it up to maybe 20 kilograms and I'm going to simulate. Let's press, uh, go back to the beginning and play. And it's just a little bit too long, but as you can see, it works. Uh, I'm going to use my go back to the beginning, use my box selection tool uh, from the front view. I'll just move this up a little bit. Maybe you know what? I'm going to go into edit mode of, of the wrecking ball. So I'll press press tab and I'm going to uh, select only the ball part of it. So if I put my mouse over the ball and I tap with nothing else selected, if I tap L, it'll select the linked parts over my uh, that are under my mouse. And if I tap S now, I can scale just that part of it. So I'm gonna make this bigger and uh, beefier. There we go, uh, right like that. And uh, I will right click in object mode, set origin to geometry, and uh, I like that better. So let's go ahead and simulate. And I'll hit the ground. So back to frame one, I'll use my selection box tool, grab it, move it up, and let's uh, re-simulate.
I like it. That's pretty cool. You'll notice that even though it's playing back at 24 frames per second, which is as fast as it really should pretty much, if your computer is slower, it will uh, play back slower the first time. You might try going into wireframe view if uh, it's playing back too slow for your liking. Uh, when you render out a movie file, it will play back at the right rate. So keep that in mind, that might help you out. I'll go back to solid view though. It's playing back really slowly though. I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but you can change the speed of your simulation. Again, this is a gigantic scene with huge, like 10, 8, 7, 5 meter long Jenga blocks. That's why it looks so slow. When they film for movie special effects, when they film miniatures, like miniature spaceships or miniature fires or explosions or street cities uh, being blown up, when they film miniatures, they film at a high frame rate and they slow it down because uh, bigger objects move slower. In this case, we want these big objects to look small. So we need to make it look faster, simulate faster. So under the scene tab, under the rigid body world settings, under settings, we can change the uh, speed of our simulation, which is right here in the uh, scene tab. So if I say speed is three, it'll play back three times as fast, which will make it look like it's a smaller whole setup. So I'll go back to the beginning, I'll press play. As you can see, it all happens quicker. And if you actually had a small setup, it would move quicker because things move at a uh, rate that's in relation to gravity on Earth, no matter how big they are. And so if something's moving less, space it's going to move that space in less time so it's going to look quicker okay so if i go and watch this again i'll speed this part of the video up <laughs> there we go uh it's uh wrecking into the or knocking over the jenga bricks and that looks pretty good you can be the judge if you think that's too fast or not fast enough enough but i'll leave it at uh three for now and i've simulated so we're pretty much done here a couple of things if you want to save this simulation and not have it kind of be disruptible if you want to change things in your scene if you want to lock this down and make it permanent the simulation you can go under the scene tab and you can do what's called bake your simulation baking a simulation means you're making it permanent you're kind of going to be making this cache bar dark and therefore you can't change or mess things up when you try to move objects in your scene okay so if i click bake it'll re-simulate and lock bake in my simulation if i say current cache to bake which i'll do right now it will make this bar darker no matter what object you have selected and now you can't mess things up you can save your blender file close your blender file and open it back up and your simulation should be intact okay if, however, you want to really make your simulation permanent, uh, by the way, you can also delete your bake if you ever want to undo it and re-simulate. Uh, you, it's not 100% permanent. You can undo it yourself or reset or undo the simulation yourself. Uh, but if you ever want to edit your simulation, like with keyframes, you can select all of your objects. So if I press A in object mode, it'll select everything in my scene. And if you want to turn this cache into keyframes for every object, you can go up to object and rigid body and bake to keyframes. I'm not sure where this option is or if it is over here somewhere. Update all to frame is something different, I think, but it is up here with every object selected. If I go to object, uh, rigid body and bake to keyframes, this might take your computer 10 to one minute to do. Uh, it might even crash your computer. So it's a good idea to save this blender file before you do this. I'm gonna live dangerously. So I'm gonna select bake to keyframes and it's gonna ask me, where do I want to start? Do I want to bake from frame one to 500? Yes, I do. Do I want to bake this simulation to every single keyframe? That means every object is going to have 500 keyframes, pretty much. If you want to skip over, do every other keyframe or every five keyframes, you can. But that means that you're going to be relying on interpolation between keyframes, which will be less accurate. And for your links of the chain, it might look like the, the chain links are coming apart because it's not tracking where every link of the chain or where every domino is or Jenga brick is for every single frame. So I would leave it at one for the most accuracy, every single keyframe. Okay, I'll press okay. Okay, so that took my computer a 
about 15 seconds to go through. There are lots of objects here. If I look at my timeline, you can see if I go to an object, if I zoom in, yeah, there's a lot of keyframes. Every single keyframe, all 500 are there. Sometimes objects won't have every single keyframe, especially if those objects don't move for a while. Although it's not very smart, there's still a bunch of keyframes, even though it's not moving at all. So you are wasting a lot of data. And if you ever want to, let's say, fix or animate yourself some of these Jenga bricks, well, you'll have to change these and pare down these keyframes so you have enough that you can actually manage them yourself. There are techniques for that. I'm not going to get into that in this video. Uh, that really will be it for this video. I think we've got a pretty good result and hope hopefully you've learned how to use the rigid body simulation fairly well. If you haven't tried this project out, it's kind of fun and it's pretty cool looking, especially if you add materials to everything and render it out to a movie file. But that will be it for this video. Of course, if you like this video, if you learned something, please go ahead and click on that like button below this video. It really helps me and my channel out and helps my channel grow. If you want to see more videos like this one in Blender 2.8 and in the Godot game engine, click on that subscribe button as well and click on the bell icon uh, below this video. If you want to be notified whenever I upload a new tutorial, check out my Facebook page at facebook.com slash borncg. On that page, I post uh, updates most frequently there. That's my most frequently used social media platform. So you guys know what I'm working on next and you get to see things from me outside of YouTube. But that'll be it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next one. Bye-bye.